is Ashley with Ashley Says So and I am back with another Old Hollywood Scandals video and today we are going to be talking about the very sexy, very sensual, the very perfect Eartha Kitt. Before we get started I want to let you know that I am not sure what's true or false in these videos. I am just here to take the rumors and the gossip of online and yesteryear and tell you guys a story. And yes, my nails are all messed up. I'm not gonna be spiffy every doggone time. So go ahead and key, key, key right now. Is y'all finished sitting up there laughing? All right, now go ahead and hit the like and subscribe button and let's get to it. Eartha Mae Keith was born on January the 17th, 1927. Her mother, or the lady that was supposedly her mother, her name was Annie Mae Keith. And she was of Cherokee and African descent. Now, Eartha's father is a totally different story. She actually did not know who her father was. The story goes like this. Annie Mae was working on a form, okay? And then the form owner's son came out and he raped Annie Mae. And Eartha is supposedly a product from that rape. Now, of course, the form owner's son was white, so this would make Eartha mulatto or mixed or whatever you want to call it. Now, some people like to name Eartha's father as a man named Daniel Sturkey, who was a doctor around those parts at that time but this has never been confirmed. Whatever the case, after Eartha was born, Annie Mae continued to try to live her life. So she went and she fell in love with a full black man and she moved into the home with the full black man. Now, allegedly this guy had a vendetta against Eartha. Like he could not stand this little girl because she was mixed race. He did not like her light skin. Basically, I guess he was upset because her father was white. He did not want her and he let Annie Mae know this. And instead of Annie Mae taking her child and leaving, she took her child and she put her off on another relative. A lady named Aunt Rosa was the one who raised Eartha at this time. And sadly, Eartha said in Aunt Rosa's care, she was abused once again for the color of her skin. Supposedly, she was a very light-skinned child. She said that she had kind of reddish hair and she said that people disliked her for this. She was just a little bit too white for everyone around. And so along with the physical abuse, they also made her basically work for her keep. She couldn't just stay in the house like everybody else. You know, she had to plow the field. She had to do whatever they told her to do in order to continue living in that household. Soon though, Eartha's mother, or the lady that is supposedly her mother, Annie Mae passes away. And Eartha is shipped up north to live with another relative. And this lady's name is Mamie Kitt. And this lady is who a lot of sources point to as Eartha Kitt's real mother. So Eartha goes up north. In fact, it's Harlem that she moves to. And she starts to attend high school. And I'm going to pause right here because I'm about to drop some T-bombs, okay? It's about to get a little bit messy. And baby, Eartha Kitt fans, y'all better not try to unsubscribe after this either. Now come on, let's get to the T. Honey, there is a group of people who say that their families basically grew up with Eartha Kid. You know, they grew up around her and her family, and they said all of that mixed stuff is a doggone lie. They said Eartha Kid is not mixed, and they also said that nobody treated her bad because her skin was light. They actually said that Eartha Kid was no lighter than a black African American light skinned person. So they really didn't know how that rumor took off. And they also said that if anybody did treat Eartha Kid differently, they teased her because she thought she was white rather than black. I don't know what to believe, but it's a lot of people who are mixed race that don't really look like what the standard mixed race person looks like. So looks really do not mean anything, but supposedly this family is not going by looks. They are going by what they know. Now, Eartha says that when she moved with Mamie, Mamie took her in because she wanted Eartha to grow up to be a famous pianist. Like she wanted Eartha to take these piano lessons. Like that is the dream that she had for Eartha. Eartha did not want to do this. She didn't want to become a pianist, so she mispracticed. You know, she just was not into it. And because of this, Mamie Kitt is supposed to have kicked Eartha out of the house. You know, she was like, if you're not going to grow up to be what I want you to be, then you're not going to live here anymore. Again, some sources say that Mamie did not kick Eartha out, that Eartha left on her own accord because Eartha wanted to do what Eartha wanted to do. However she left or whatever happened is of no consequence because when she did leave, she ended up getting a job as a seamstress. And she was taking care of herself as best she could, but it was one day that the heavens opened up and smiled on her. And that is when she was just standing on the street corner and a lady pulled up and the lady asked her for directions to a certain address. And while Eartha was giving her the address or the directions, the lady basically looked her over and started talking to her and told Eartha, hey, 
I am a member of the Catherine Dunham Dance Company. And Eartha was like, really? And the lady was like, yes, I am. And then the lady goes on to say, actually, would you like to come and be a part of our dance company? And of course, Eartha Kitt was like, yes. And when Eartha got there, she caught on like this. And she quickly became a rising star of the Catherine Dunham Dance Company. They also found out that she could sing. So they put her on display a lot. And she ended up doing very well with that company. She stayed with them from 1943 to 1948. Now, by the time that she had left Catherine Dunham, Eartha had already started to sing in nightclubs all around Paris. In fact, there was one nightclub where she became a major hit amongst lesbian women. And the owner of that nightclub was said to be a beautiful woman. I mean, beautiful. And this lady's name was Fred. And Fred was actually an ex-lover of Marlena Dietrich. Now this is just a rumor, but it said that Eartha got her a little taste of Fred her own self. Eartha was going to club after club after club. She was definitely spreading her name around. And this is also when she started to acquire her cat-like feline features. You know what I mean? Hawing and all that purring and you know those squinty eyes and that tongue roll y'all know what i'm talking about and again this is around the 1940s 1950s and what eartha did with this persona was bring something new to the table something fresh i mean there were a lot of entertainers around at this time and there were a lot of sex symbols you know what i mean a whole bunch of bombshells but nobody really had this characteristic that eartha had so audiences fell in love with her and she became the darling of the local club scene. And it was while she was purring and pawing and doing all this on stage that Mr. Orson Welles saw her. And immediately he fell in love with Eartha Kitt. And I'm not talking about a love like, oh, I love her so much, I'm in love with her, I want to marry her. Not that type of love. I'm talking about a love like, oh my God. God, look at this goddess. Oh, look at that brown skin. She's so bronze. She's magnifique. You know, that type of love. And because he thought of her as just this walking flame of beauty, he cast her as Helen of Troy in 1950. And that was when he staged a production called Dr. Faustus. And in this production, Eartha did not disappoint. She was everything that he thought she would be. I mean, she really, really blew his mind. He became sort of like, like a obsessed with her, you know, just wanting to be around her, you know. So he started walking her up to her room. He started watching the sunsets with her. And he also started making sure that any food that touched her mouth didn't cost less than $100. Now that's in today's money. I don't know what the equivalent of that would have been back in 1950, maybe $20 or $30, I'm not sure. But very, very expensive food. That's all she ate, that's all he allowed her to eat. When he sent up lunch to her room or when they went out anywhere, he made sure that it was nothing but the best for Miss Kit. And in all actuality, Orson was one of the first, if not the first man, to actually spoil Eartha Kit. You know what I'm saying? He got her used to this very expensive life lifestyle she loved the taste of this food she loved receiving these gifts and this is something that she grew to expect shoot she want to go back to that other mess i mean it's like jay-z said uh she used a million dollar vacations what y'all gonna do with that you know kind of like that but see the thing about it is that although orson was doing all this he and eartha were not messing around yet they did mess around a little bit later in life, although when Eartha was asked about it, she claimed, no, it was strictly professional. I never messed around with Orson Welles, but sources say that's a doggone lie. She did sleep with Orson Welles. Oh, and here's one more thing to add. It said that once she did give in and sleep with Orson, she rocked his entire world. Now, after performing in Orson's production, Eartha went back to performing in clubs. She also had began making music. And some of her most famous songs were recorded around this time, such as Let's Do It, Champagne Taste, Ceci Bon, and I'd Rather Be Burned as a Witch. And her record sold just as well as the sold out club appearances because the world pretty much got to hear how Eartha Kitt sang. And she sang very... Uh, feisty, very snappy, you know, she cut at every word, very sharp. 
And one of the things that appealed to audiences was this voice. It was very, very unique. And it became even more unique because she became fluent in French, German, and Dutch. Because she knew these different languages, this would give her a cutting edge above other performers who only knew one language. And Eartha would take this ability and she would play with it like she would be singing a song and she would mix two languages together in an instant during that song. And I'm going to leave a link in the description of a great example of her doing this and that is when she sang a song called Come On To My House and that is my song. It go like this, come on to my house, my house will come on. Come on to my house, my house will come on. Ocho soca laka saka maka saka diki. Hey! Y'all know I don't know the other language, but that is. Ooh! I just told y'all to do something at the end of that song. Ooh, girl, come on, let's go past it. I'm sorry, y'all. Even though all those songs I named were good and they sold well, it is when she came out with her signature hit that she cemented her position as a songstress and also as a sexual, sensual damsel. And that song was Santa Baby. And honey, people loved the song anyway, but when they came out with a music video for that song, Oh, baby, you just about could kill folks dead, hon. When that camera panned up on them long legs and she had on that white fur stole wrapped around her and that's all she had on, it I'm telling you, hey, I got excited when I watched that doggone video. Eartha Kitt was killing it, baby, and could nobody touch her, you hear me? Girl, I'm serious, I was so excited about it, I tried it, like, I wanted to order me like a fur thing, you know what I'm saying? But y'all, when I tried it, I'm not gonna sit up there and tell y'all what my legs look like when the camera panned up on me. We're not gonna talk about that. But, like I said, she really became sex kitten number one. And of course, I'm dropping that link in the description because y'all got to see that so y'all can get excited over that like I got excited over it. Anyway, because this video and other songs that she did and just the way she was anyway cemented her position as sex kid number one, like I said, a lot of women started to get uncomfortable with Eartha Kid. You know what I'm saying? Because she walked into this image with no problem. When she performed, sometimes she would walk through the audience and she kind of rub on folks' husband's shoulders, swing that black thing all up in that man's face, kind of get up in their face and brrr, you know what I mean? And baby, some of them wives wasn't having that. And then the sad thing about it though, is that as uncomfortable as the wives got, some of them husbands, they still had the nerve to sit up there and stand up whooping, hollering and clapping and stuff like that. And y'all think I'm playing and over exaggerating, but baby, this is supposedly true. They said some of them wives was like, uh, what you clapping for? As a matter of fact, it got so bad that Eartha felt the need to start putting the wives at ease. And it said that after she did a number, especially if the number was really, really sensual and sexual, that she would end the show by saying, oh, you know, don't mind me. I do go a little overboard. I like to get affection from my audience because I was raised with no affection, you know, so I am guilty of sometimes needing and wanting a little bit more affection from my audience than I should have. And when she said this, this supposedly put the wives at ease. They were not flaming mad anymore. Well, not flaming mad at her anymore. The husbands, it probably was still a different story, baby, because, I mean, that explains why she need the affection, but that don't explain why you giving her the affection, though back to the story though, Eartha saying what she said about her family and just her always talking about her family and her bad life that she had when she was younger in general led some people to believe that she would start using this as an excuse for her bad behavior. Especially in 1954 when she did an interview and I'm not sure if the interviewer asked her about her family or he kind of saw some of her family come before but whatever the case, Eartha told him that, you know, when family members show up at my show, I just shrug them off. And I kind of act like they're not there because I remember the way that they treated me and my mother. Because I was so light-skinned, they treated me badly. So I shrugged them off and treat them badly. She didn't say those words verbatim, but that is the gist of what she was saying. But this brings us back to that original rumor. What if she had lied and her family didn't treat her that way? That means that she was just treating her family badly when they showed up just because. Was she ashamed that her black family was coming around? Or was she genuinely upset with that side of the family because they had treated her badly? 
you guys decide. So anyways, as we've already established, Earthly has been a major success on the show circuit. Honey, it's about to get messy because they said Miss Eartha got a real, real big head and her attitude got very nasty and very snobby. They said she was treating people like they didn't exist. I mean, like they were complete nobodies. Wouldn't even say hello to nobody, you know, coming on the set, going straight to her dressing room, just acting like the ultimate diva and the ultimate star. She didn't have sympathy for people. There's this one story that Elizabeth Welch put out about her when they were working on a production called Mrs. Patterson. And the way Elizabeth tells it is that there was this elderly veteran actress. She was 80 years old and her name was Connie Smith. And Miss Connie was in this production with Elizabeth and Eartha. And like I already stated, Connie was 80 years old, you know, so she did still have some acting chops, but her memory was not so tight anymore, you know what I'm saying? So sometimes she would like shake, slip, and slur all over the line, and she just sometimes had trouble in general. Her Elizabeth, while everybody else was kind of like, you know, just going with the motion, you know, kind of feeling sorry for the woman, honey, they said Miss Eartha was over there like, <laughs> uh, you know, is she gonna ever get the line right? You know, acting like that. And I'm sure that Eartha was not the only one frustrated with this lady, but I'm supposing the lady needed the money. So, you know, people kind of just look past it. You know what I'm saying? Probably just hoping like, oh my gosh, I hope she get the line right this time. But honey, I guess she shook, slip and slid over a line one too many times. And baby, next thing I know, they said Miss Eartha Kid huffed over to that back room, made a phone call, and child, them folks came in and walked that woman off the set, child. Eartha Kid had called somebody, child, and got Miss Connie Littell fired from the show. This supposedly happened in 1956. And in 1958, Eartha Kitt made her debut as a film actress. As soon as she got on the screen, she started sleeping with all the brothers, child. I mean, all the brothers. It's rumored that she slept with Sidney Poitier. It is rumored that she slept with Nat King Cole, Harry Belafonte, Sammy Davis Jr., just about every black leading man. If that man was on the screen, nine times out of 10, Eartha was in his bed. And honey, back to Sammy Davis Jr., they said Eartha got real messy when it came to him. Because see, when he first wanted to introduce himself to her, she was up in her room somewhere. I don't know exactly where this took place, but supposedly she was up in her room, getting dressed, doing something and her assistant came up to her and said, hey, Sammy Davis Jr. is downstairs. He would like to meet you. And child, guess what Miss Eartha said? Who is Sammy Davis Jr.? I mean, is that like the door boy? Like, who is he? <laughs> child, I'm telling you, Eartha Kitt was a downright mess. Who is Sammy Davis Jr.? Are you kidding me? But anyways, this is what Eartha herself supposedly said that she said when Sammy Davis Jr. wanted to meet her. Eventually, I guess her assistant explained to her like, no, Sammy Davis Jr. is one of the biggest black actors at this time. I don't know how that happened, but whatever the case, he did come up and he did meet her, he introduced himself, and they were friends for a little while. Then like a couple of weeks later, he asked her on a date, so they actually started dating. And when they did, Eartha says that he took her to a little Chinese restaurant, and she also said at the restaurant, everybody knew who she was, but she said nobody knew who Sammy Davis Jr. was. She said it was so bad that Sammy Davis Jr. basically said to her like, Man, I've been on the stage and on television since I was like four years old, but everybody knows you and none of these people know me. Cha, I just don't know about that. But anyways, this is what supposedly Eartha said happened, like I said. So they're starting to date, but Eartha was way more learned than him. And I don't know if I should really say the word learned. Culture, that's what she was. She was much more cultured than him. She enjoyed art, you know what I mean? She enjoyed going to look at the Italian ruins and you know, she was just really, really cultured. She had been all around the world. And although Sammy Davis Jr. had traveled, he was not into that type of stuff. Like he didn't care about Picasso and you know, Van Gogh and all this kind of stuff. He wasn't into that, but what he was into was comic books. He loved comic books. Well, it's said that when Sammy Davis Jr. brought her back to his apartment and he showed her his comic book collection and all of this type of stuff, that Eartha basically was condescending. You know what I'm saying? She kind of like smiled like a little condescending smile and was like, mm-hmm, okay, you know, that's good. You into this? Oh, okay, hmm. And they said that Sammy was a little bit ashamed about this, you know what I'm saying? Because she made him feel like, hey, you stupid little boy, who cares about comic books? But apparently he couldn't have been too ashamed or too sad about it because 
Not long after that, he gave her a huge diamond ring. Now, Eartha says that originally, this was intended to be an engagement ring. And Sammy Davis Jr. wanted to marry her, and she told him, no, I can't marry you. And so Sammy Davis Jr. basically was like, okay, you know what, just take the ring. And she said, no, Sammy, I cannot take this ring because as soon as I put the ring on, people are gonna think that we're engaged. And so Sammy Davis Jr. told her, you know, just tell them it's a friendship ring. That's all this is about. I want you to have the ring. And so she took it. And sure enough, as soon as Eartha walked out of the room, cameras started flashing and they were all wanting to see the ring. So that is when she and Sammy told the paparazzi that, hey, no, this is not an engagement ring. This is a friendship ring. Well, child, I guess since Eartha didn't accept it as an engagement ring, Sammy Davis Jr. felt like, well, shoot, this ring did not give me what I wanted it to get me, so I'm not about to pay the bill for this ring. Baby, they say soon Eartha Kid got a call from the jeweler basically telling her, I need that ring back. And Eartha hung up on him and was like, you know, this ring was given to me as a friend. And the person showed up at her door and was like, listen to me, Sammy Davis Jr. has not paid for this ring. I'm gonna need this ring back. And they said that Eartha told him again that this is my ring. Sammy Davis Jr. gave it to me. So the jeweler got in contact with Sammy Davis Jr. and was like, hey, something gonna have to happen. I need my money or I need my ring. So they say that Sammy and the jeweler basically came up with a plan and told Eartha that, hey, you know, we're gonna put out in the magazines that Sammy wanted to marry you and you played him like a fool. Like you out here sleeping with folks, you led him on, you know, he gave you this ring and you did him any kind of way and you broke Sammy Davis Jr.'s heart. And so Eartha was afraid of this because Sammy Davis Jr. at this time was the darling of show business. He was everybody's friend, he was the funny guy. So if it seemed like she actually did these things and broke his heart and cheated on him, oh, it was gonna be a big mess. It was gonna be some problems. And her career could have been ruined right then because she would have been known as like a she-devil. And I guess that she and Sammy stopped talking for a while, but clearly over the years, they forgave each other over the situation and became friends again. Now let's talk about another lover, Nat King Cole. It is said that Nat King Cole was head over heels for Eartha Kid, and he was cheating on his wife Maria with no problem. They said that Nat was even considering leaving Maria Littell for Eartha Kid. She had him just that much. But eventually, it said that he realized that Eartha was just much too fast paced for him. He might leave his wife for her, and then Eartha would never settle down. She would never stop sleeping with other men. So he ended up leaving her alone and staying with his wife Maria. And then you have the the whole Harry Belafonte debacle. What? Child. This one right here is scandalous, honey. I got to say it, baby. The scandal, child. The scandal. Because, baby, the stories say that Miss Eartha was basically laying in the bed naked and she was either waiting for Harry Belafonte to come too bad or they had just got finished doing what they were doing. And while she was laying in the bed, cooing and purring and looking sexy, and Harry is basically like pulling up his pants, buckling his belt and wiping the sweat off his head with a towel, you know, and basically telling her, you know, hey, I don't know what you're sitting up there looking like that for. This is not that. I cannot be with you. I don't want to be with you. Your black tail can't do nothing for me. Yes, child. And Earthy said that Harry Belafonte basically told her, it ain't nothing that a black woman can do for me. Y'all might be out there asking, like, how can a black woman not do nothing for you, but you got one laying naked in your bed right now? But that is not what he meant. He's not saying that he's not attracted to black women. Oh, he's attracted to black women all day long. Because, baby, y'all know he supposedly also slept with Dorothy Dandridge. So he's sleeping with him like that. But he said that they couldn't do anything for him as far as like they couldn't advance his career. You know what I'm saying? They could not bring him more wealth. They could not bring him success. They did not possess the power to do that. But the white women did. So he basically made up in his mind that he was going to marry a white woman because the white woman would bring him more wealth, more security. But before we all harp on Harry Belafonte for saying this, let me give y'all a little perspective. Let me put this in context for y'all. The reason Earth even told people that Harry Belafonte said this is because she herself was asked a question I think by an interviewer or somebody and they asked her look behind hey why is it that you didn't marry a black man why is it that you married a white man and that is when Eartha Kitt said you know I wanted to be with Sidney Poitier you know what I'm saying I wanted to be with Harry Belafonte but these men did not want to be with me these men wanted to be with white women so because of that hey you know I had to marry a white man you know, there was just no black men around. I had to marry a white man. 
Essentially, they were doing the same thing because yes, all of the black Hollywood men might have been taken, but there's millions of other black men, you know what I mean? And also, there were some wealthy black men back then. It wasn't a lot of them, but I'm pretty sure there was at least one wealthy black man that could have been found. So, you know, let's move on. Now, before we get into her marriage with her husband, let's go ahead and talk about some other relationships she allegedly had. Because it is rumored that Eartha Kid had a threesome with James Dean and Paul Newman, child. And yes, a lot of people already know about this threesome, but see, what they're missing is that they didn't know that Eartha Kid and James Dean had already been messing with each other. They had already had a sexual relationship for a while now. Eartha said that their relationship was so strong that they shared soul ties. Their lovemaking was just wow. Well, then James Dean invited his buddy, Paul Newman, to share this experience with him. Eartha was in her dance studio and child James and Paul came up there and Eartha was like, opened up for it. You know what I'm saying? It is what it is. And so they did what they did. And when Eartha spoke about this, she said, I had two white men this morning and it was delicious. It was the best thing I've ever had. She also said that they took her body to the heaven. She said it was like a celestial thing, their lovemaking. She said she had pleasure that she had never known from any other men with these two guys. So, you know, yeah. Now, it is claimed that Eartha Kitt was another one of those people that slept around to advance her career, just like a lot of women at that time period. But then other sources say that she wasn't trying to advance anything. She just liked sleeping around. She was very free and very open with her mind, body, soul. Like, that is just the way she was. She felt like that when we were put on this earth, we were meant to live. And to her, that meant trying everything under the sun pretty much and gossip also says that a lot of this sleeping around got her some magnificent gifts from several lovers she did not get these gifts only because of what orson wells did men felt like they had to give her these gifts anyway it was because of the type of person that she was and also the characters that she betrayed the songs that she sang she set an expectation in a lot of men that in order to even get a whiff of Miss Eartha Kitt, you know what I'm saying? In order to even get close to this goddess, I gotta have godlike money. I gotta come with it. My pockets gotta be on 10. And because they felt like this and they expected her to want gifts, a lot of times Eartha didn't even have to say a thing. She had it like that. Now, Eartha had soared through the 1950s, you know what I'm saying? She's this awesome actress, she's this awesome singer, and now, after all of these romances, she's ready to settle down a bit and find a husband. And she actually thought that she was going to marry a cosmetic magnet, and his name was Charles Refson, because they had a long-time relationship. But that didn't work out, he did not marry her. So then she started dating banking heir, John Barry Ryan III, and she thought they were going to marry, and they ended up not getting married. But then she met John William McDonald, and she ended up falling head over heels in love with him, and he felt the same about her, and they did end up getting married. And that was on June the 6th, 1960. They had a daughter named Kit McDonald, born on November the 26th, 1961, and they were quite the happy family for a while, but Eartha Kit is a spitfire. So they ended up divorcing in 1965 and Eartha Kitt herself has said in an interview, she doesn't compromise for men. So if you don't compromise for your mate, I don't care if it's male or female, if you don't give any compromising at all, nine times out of 10, that relationship is not really going to work out because it's going to be very one-sided. Speaking of the 1960s though, it was also in the 1960s that Batman became a hit show. And Eartha Kitt was cast to play Catwoman soon after Julie Newmar left the show. And as soon as she became cast, this became the second thing that she was iconic for in her life. She was the quintessential Catwoman. Nobody really even remembers Julie Newmar playing that role because when Eartha Kitt got it, she just took over. I mean, she was the Catwoman anyway. Like she had so many times before, she wowed the audience again. This time it was the TV audience. They loved her spunk. They loved the way she wore her long ponytail, and most of all, they loved the way that she used to whip those slender hips and that skin-tight leather outfit. But I would say, and I'm sure most people would agree with me, that the most iconic thing about her Catwoman overall 
was her voice. The lady was made to play that role. And really at this time, almost anything that Eartha Kitt put her finger on was great because she was beautiful. You know, she had a quick wit. Her spirit was very fiery. She was spicy. You know, she was a feisty little thing. She was always the smallest one in the room, but also the quickest one to speak her mind. And per the rumors, another icon modeled her whole persona off of Eartha Kitt. And this woman's name was Miss Diana Ross. Child, it said that in the 60s, Diana Ross based her whole style off of Eartha Kitt. And I can actually kind of see this, can y'all? And so since Eartha Kitt had this type of flair about herself, the 1960s passed on without incident. That is until the late 1960s. That is when I guess she kind of felt accomplished, you know what I mean? She had been in the films, she had did the nightclubs, she had put out records, you know, she was very successful. So I believe that maybe she wanted to do something else maybe she got a little restless or maybe it really was on her heart to become an activist because that is what she did she started wading a little bit more into political affairs and she ended up establishing an organization called the kitsville youth foundation and it was a chartered non-profit organization for underprivileged youths in what and those children that were under her care or that became part of the program started to call themselves rebels with a cause and on top of this, Eartha also became a part of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. And being a part of these two umbrellas led to her finding out a lot more about poverty and racial unrest and civil unrest. And because of this, she learned that the Vietnam War was the cause of civil unrest, you know, youth unrest, poverty. And when she learned this, she made it her mission to fight this, to fight the Vietnam War and anybody she felt that was backing this war. And this led to what she said on that fateful day in January of 1968. Child, that is when Miss Eartha Kid was invited to the White House and baby, 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 let me tell you, honey, she showed all the way out. Baby, the first lady of the United States, Miss Lady Bird Johnson, had the nerve to ask Miss Eartha Kitt what she felt about the Vietnam War, baby. Why did she do that? Chai Eartha Kitt let that woman know the truth. She let her know what she really felt. You send the best of this country off to be shot in Maine. No wonder the kids rebel and take pot. That was Lady Bird Johnson's face after that. But listen now, Eartha Kitt was not finished, baby. She also said, There are so many things burning the people of this country, particularly mothers. They feel like they are going to raise sons. And you have children of your own, Miss Johnson. We raise children and send them to war. After she made this speech, Lady Bird Johnson sat in that chair and cried, honey. Weeped like a little bitty baby. She was very shamed. And when she did this, criticized the United States and the decisions that it was making and when she made the first lady cry, she had to kiss her career goodbye. Her career in the United States was essentially over. And even if anybody wanted to be a friend to her and try to revive her career in the US at this time, oh baby, it wouldn't happen because there was one person who was super duper upset that Lady Bird Johnson got the crying and that was her husband, President Lyndon B. Johnson. So Chai, he got the FBI and the CIA all over Eartha Kitt's case. And he made sure that she wouldn't work again. But not only did he do that, he also had information spread around the whole U.S. calling her a sadistic nymphomaniac. You know, she's crazy off her rocker. The only thing she thinks about all day, all night is men. You know, she's very out there. Check out her background. Basically just putting this woman down and acting like she was just open for business. And of course, like they do all blacklisted people, they started following her, you know, tapping her phone calls, doing all kind of stuff like she was a threat to the U.S. The sad thing about all of this is that everything that they did to her, it did work. And her career would never be the same. It would never get back to where it was. Because her career was ruined over here in the U.S., she went over to Europe and she performed in Asia. She went anywhere she could to make money because she couldn't make it here. And so in the 70s, all of her work was overseas and she did well over there. It was just that 
her name kind of became non-existent over here. And then finally, in 1978, Eartha Kitt came back over to the United States and she performed in New York and she performed in the production Timbuktu and it was critically acclaimed. Everybody loved her, you know, there were grand celebrations. Everybody was happy that Eartha Kitt was back and she did a wonderful job. And by the time the 1980s came around, Eartha Kitt was back in the studio recording hit songs. She also became a strong defender of LGBTQ. Well, back then it was called gay rights. I think that's all that it was called, but she was a strong defender of that. She felt like people should date and marry whoever they wanted to marry. And if I'm not mistaken, it was also in the 1980s when this young, beautiful, little quirky, funny actress started to get a lot of shine. She was really something else. She knew how to purr, she was really flirty, and she was also quickly becoming a sex symbol. She just had curves for days, and her smile was a megawatt smile. And this lady had everything a man could want, and her name was Jack A. Harry. And I'm sure Miss Jack A. looked up to Eartha, because essentially, Eartha was the same sex symbol that Jack A. Harry was becoming. And when she saw Eartha in public, I'm sure she wanted to go up to her and tell her, oh, Mary, Mary, look, there go Mrs. Kid. Oh, Mrs. Kid, you are a goddess, Mrs. Kid. I mean, you are just everything. You are such an inspiration. Ah! Mrs. Kid. Yes, child, Jack A couldn't even finish the sentence, honey, before Eartha Kid reached back and slapped up out of her and that is what Jack A said. I can only imagine the situation child. Jack A probably fell back like Wayman did. You know what I'm saying? On the low down dirty shame when Wayman sat up there and was doing too much and he got slapped by Bernard. And the reason Eartha slapped her is because Jack A was messing with Eartha Kid's man. You know what I'm saying? Now Jack A said that she was indeed messing with this guy but she had no idea that he belonged to Eartha Kid. That's what she says. She said that she did not know that she was messing with Eartha Kid's man. But what I I do know is somewhere and somehow Eartha Kid came up to Jack A. Harry and slapped the hussy out of her. Nikki, I'ma get your little tail because you sat up there and put that in the community tab with your crazy tail. Anyways, let's go to the 1990s. This was a new decade and Eartha Kid was still thugging. I mean, this woman was 62 years old and was jumping on folks like it wasn't nothing. Yeah, the year is 1990. And Eartha Kid announces that she's having a party. So she sends the invites out and one of the people that's invited is Frances Davis. This is the ex-wife of Miles Davis. And I'm sure Frances was excited to get this invite. You know what I'm saying? So she's probably all dressed up, you know, ready to have a good time. She gets there, she's laughing, giggling, chatting. And when the party is over, everybody says their goodbyes and Frances grabs her coat, you know, and she's walking out of the door. Baby, the next thing Frances knows, she didn't got grabbed from behind, child. Eartha and grabbed her like, Ugh, you know, and then she spin Francis around. Baby, she did Francis' face like this, and then she put her other hand around Francis' neck, child. And this is crazy, and I mean, you got to be the ultimate beast. How do you invite somebody to a party, chat with them, dance with them, and have a good time all night long just to have this plan that at the end of the party, you finna jump on this person? So like I said, Eartha has pushed this woman from the back and turned her around, and also, I forgot to tell you, knocked the glasses off of Francis' face and got this woman like this. And so Frances don't know what's going on and she's trying to back up and get out of it. And when she does, they both fall to the ground. But even though they are on the ground, Frances is still choked up, baby. Eartha still got that woman by the neck and still got her by the face. That I guess people pulled Eartha off of her and Frances, baby, she ain't trying to fight back or nothing. Do you hear me? Frances gathered up her stuff and took her little tail and got up out of there. But she also hit Eartha Kid with a major lawsuit. And from what I found to this day, nobody knows why Eartha jumped on her. You know, if y'all know the real reason, please put it in the comments because I couldn't find out why, but I am inclined to believe that while Frances was there, she probably was making eyes or something to somebody that Eartha Kid liked because if she's already slapped Jack A, Clearly, she will go to battle over a man. She will fight over a man. Not only was Eartha fighting, it is said that she was still very much off the chain in her sex life, just like she was in the 50s. You know what I'm saying? She had not slowed down in the 80s or 90s. And she also was still taking very, very risque roles, like when she started in Boomerang. And baby, one thing about Boomerang is Miss Eartha Kitt was put there like a punchline as a joke, 
But, honey, I'm going to tell you one thing that wasn't no joke. The way baby doll looked in that lingerie, honey, her legs were still fine and nice, and she was still small and tender, and you know what I'm saying? She looked good for the taking to a lot of men. As a matter of fact, somebody was in the comments talking about some, I, I don't know what Marcus was tripping over. Talking about, baby, if that would have been me sitting up there with Eartha Kid, it would have been on because that woman was still fine, and she was still fine. And she definitely was a highlight of that movie, especially when she was like, ma. Yes, you know, grrr, you know, doing all that. And since Eartha Kitt was pretty freaky, I was looking for some tea that was gonna tell me that she and Eddie Murphy messed around. And no, I didn't end up finding any tea like that, but to be honest with you, it seems like Eddie Murphy would have been more inclined to mess with Grace Jones. She was more of his speed to me. But I didn't see where they messed around either, so let's move on. So through the rest of the 90s and the 2000s, Eartha Kitt continued to perform. She made appearances in a few more shows and a few more movies. You know, her career was pretty much steady. She was one of the few people who became an icon during their lifetime, much like Little Richard did. Now, Eartha ended up dying of colon cancer on Christmas Day in the year of 2008. Her daughter, Kit Shapiro, was at home with her. And she said that Eartha Kit was screaming, like right before she passed away, she was screaming to the top of her lungs. I'm not sure exactly why she was screaming. I'm not sure if she just like didn't want to leave this world or what was going on. But Kit Shapiro basically said that her mother was a fighter until the end. Her daughter also said that in the weeks leading up to her mother's death, that Eartha started to see people that were not there. And these people were so real to her that she would ask her daughter, Kit, like, you know, hey, look at, you know, maybe Walter or somebody. I don't know. I made up a name, but look at so-and-so over there. You know what I mean? And so she would hold a conversation with this person trying to get her daughter to join in and talk with them. But of course, her daughter could not see these people. And this is the end of the old Hollywood scandalous tale of Miss Eartha Kid. There is one more T-bomb that I want to drop on you. Now, it is rumored that at one point, Eartha Kid actually saw her birth certificate. You know, she was reading over it. And at the father's name, it was supposedly whited out. It did not say that the name wasn't there. It is said that the name was literally whited out. Now, there are two theories for this. The first theory is that her father was a prominent man, you know what I mean? That somebody is really holding the origins of this man. They don't want to ruin his reputation. He was somebody of high status. And the second theory is that Eartha Kitt knows who her father was. That she has always known who her father was. And her father was a black man and not this white mystery man. And that she basically fed into this mystery to make herself more mysterious and to make herself more exotic that is the last rumor of this video go ahead and subscribe and like this video thank you thank you so much to my fans and thank y'all for letting me be transparent on that live i appreciate that so much that is what i've always wanted from my audience and baby since i got the audience to let me do it ooh! child y'all don't know how excited and how happy that makes me feel because i always wanted to talk to my family and y'all my family yes so anyways go ahead and like and subscribe i love y'all i'll see y'all next time bye